Eric Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirteen. The Sequel of My Resolution. For anything I know, I may have had some wild idea of running all the way to Dover when I gave up the pursuit of the young man with the donkey cart and started for Greenwich. My scattered senses were soon collected as to that point if I had, for I came to a stop in the Kent Road at a terrace with a piece of water before it and a great foolish image in the middle blowing a dry shell. Here I sat down on a doorstep, quite spent and exhausted with the efforts I had already made and with hardly breath enough to cry for the loss of my box and half-guinea. It was by this time dark. I heard the clock strike ten as I sat resting, but it was a summer night, fortunately, and fine weather. When I had recovered my breath and had got rid of a stifling sensation in my throat, I rose up and went on. In the midst of my distress I had no notion of going back. I doubt if I should have had any, though there had been a Swiss snowdrift in the Kent Road. But my standing possessed of only three halfpence in the world, and I am sure I wonder how they came to be left in my pocket on a Saturday night, troubled me none the less because I went on. I began to picture to myself as a scrap of newspaper intelligence, of being found dead in a day or two under some hedge, and I trudged on miserably, though as fast as I could, until I happened to pass a little shop, where it was written up that ladies' and gentlemen's wardrobes were bought, and that the best prices were given for rags, bones, and kitchen stuff. The master of this shop was sitting at the door in his shirt sleeves smoking, and as there were a great many coats and pairs of trousers dangling from the low ceiling, and only two feeble candles burning inside to show what they were, I fancied that he looked like a man of a revengeful disposition who had hung all his enemies and was enjoying himself. My late experiences with Mr. and Mrs. Micawber suggested to me that there might be a means of keeping off the wolf for a little while. I went up the next street, took off my waistcoat, rolled it neatly under my arm, and came back to the shop door. "'If you please, sir,' I said, "'I am to sell this for a fair price.' Mr. Dollaby, Dollaby was the name over the shop door at least, took the waistcoat, stood his pipe on its head against the door-post, went into the shop, followed by me, snuffed the two candles with his fingers, spread the waistcoat on the counter, and looked at it there, held it up against the light and looked at it there, and ultimately said, "'What do you call a fair price now, for this little waistcoat?' "'Oh, you know best, sir,' I returned modestly. "'I can't be buyer and seller, too,' said Mr. Dollaby. Put a price on this here little waistcoat. Would eighteen pence be? I hinted after some hesitation. Mr. Dollaby rolled it up again and gave it back to me. I should rob my family, he said, if I was to offer nine pence for it. This was a disagreeable way of putting the business, because it imposed upon me, a perfect stranger, the unpleasantness of asking Mr. Dollaby to rob his family on my account. My circumstances being so very pressing, however, I said I would take ninepence for it, if he pleased. Mr. Dollaby, not without some grumbling, gave ninepence. I wished him good-night, and walked out of the shop, the richer by that sum, and the poorer by a waistcoat. But when I buttoned my jacket, that was not much. Indeed, I foresaw pretty clearly that my jacket would go next, and that I should have to make the best of my way to Dover in a shirt and pair of trousers and might deem myself lucky if I got there even in that trim. But my mind did not run so much on this as might be supposed. Beyond the general impression of the distance before me, and of the young man with the donkey-cart having used me cruelly, I think I had no very urgent sense of my difficulties when I once again set off with my ninepence in my pocket. A plan had occurred to me for passing the night, which I was going to carry into execution. This was to lie behind the wall at the back of my old school, in a corner where there used to be a haystack. I imagined it would be a kind of company to have the boys and the bedroom where I used to tell the stories so near me, although the boys would know nothing of my being there, and the bedroom would yield me no shelter. I had had a hard day's work, and was pretty well jaded when I came climbing out at last upon the level of black heath. It cost me some trouble to find out Salem House, but I found it, and I found a haystack in a corner, and I lay down by it, 
having first walked around the wall and looked up at the windows and seen that all was dark and silent within. Never shall I forget the lonely sensation of first lying down without a roof above my head. Sleep came upon me as it came on many other outcasts, against whom house doors were locked and house dogs barked that night, and I dreamed of lying on my old school bed, talking to the boys in my room, and found myself sitting upright with Steerforth's name upon my lips, looking wildly at the stars that were glistening and glimmering above me. When I remembered where I was at that untimely hour, a feeling stole upon me that made me get up, afraid of I don't know what, and walk about. But the fainter glimmers of the stars and the pale light in the sky, where the day was coming, reassured me, and my eyes being very heavy, I lay down again and slept, though without a knowledge in my sleep that I was cold, until the warm beams of the sun and the ringing of the getting-up bell at Salem House awoke me. If I could have hoped that Steerforth was there, I would have lurked about until he came out alone, but I knew he must have left long since. Traddle still remained, perhaps, but it was very doubtful, and I had not sufficient confidence in his discretion, or good luck, however strong my reliance was on his good nature, to wish to trust him with my situation, so I crept away from the wall as Mr. Creakle's boys were getting up, and struck into the long, dusty track which I had first known to be the Dover Road, when I was one of them, and when I little expected that my eyes would ever see me the wayfarer I was now upon it. What a different Sunday morning from the old Sunday morning at Yarmouth! In due time I heard the church bells ringing as I plodded on, and I met people who were going to church, and I passed a church or two where the congregation were inside, and the sound of singing came out into the sunshine, while the beadle sat and cooled himself in the shade of the porch, or stood beneath a yew tree with his hand to his forehead, glowering at me going by. But the peace and rest of the old Sunday morning were on everything, except me. That was the difference. I felt quite wicked in my dirt and dust, with my tangled hair. But for the quiet picture I had conjured up of my mother in her youth and beauty, weeping by the fire, and my aunt relenting to her, I hardly think I should have had the courage to go on until next day. But it always went before me, and I followed. I got that Sunday through three-and-twenty miles on the straight road, though not very easily, for I was new to that kind of toil. I see myself, as evening closes in, coming over the bridge at Rochester, footsore and tired, and eating bread that I had bought for supper, one or two little houses with the notice, Lodgings for Travellers, hanging outside had tempted me, but I was afraid of spending the few pence I had, and was even more afraid of the vicious looks of the trampers I had met or overtaken. I sought no shelter, therefore, but the sky, and toiling on to Chatham, which in that night's aspect is a mere dream of chalk and drawbridges, and mastless ships in a muddy river, roofed like Noah's Ark, crept at last upon a sort of grass-grown battery overhanging a lane, where a sentry was walking to and fro. Here I lay down, near a cannon, and, happily in the society of the sentry's footsteps, though he knew no more of my being above him than the boys at Salem House had known of my lying by the wall, slept soundly until morning. Very stiff and sore of foot I was in the morning, quite dazed by the beating of the drums and the marching of the troops, which seemed to hem me in on every side when I went down towards the long, narrow street. Feeling that I could go but a very little way that day, if I were to reserve any strength for getting to my journey's end, I resolved to make the sale of my jacket its principal business. Accordingly I took the jacket off, that I might learn to do without it, and, carrying it under my arm, began a tour of inspection of the various slop-shops. It was a likely place to sell a jacket in, for the dealers in second-hand clothes were numerous, and were, generally speaking, on the lookout for customers at their shop doors. But as most of them had hanging up among their stock an officer's coat or two, epaulettes and all, I was rendered timid by the costly nature of their dealings, and walked about for a long time without offering my merchandise to any one. This modesty of mine directed my attention to the marine store shops, and such shops as Mr. Dollarby's, in preference to the regular dealers. 
At last I found one that I thought looked promising, at the corner of a dirty lane, ending in an enclosure full of stinging nettles, against the palings of which some second-hand sailors' clothes, that seemed to have overflowed the shop, were fluttering among some cots and rusty guns and oilskin hats, and certain trays full of so many old rusty keys, of so many sizes, that they seemed various enough to open all the doors in the world. Into this shop which was low and small, and which was darkened rather than lightened by a little window, overhung with clothes, and was descended into by some steps, I went with a palpitating heart, which was not relieved when I saw an ugly old man, with the lower part of his face all covered with a stubbly grey beard, rushed out of a dirty den behind it, and seized me by the hair of my head. He was a dreadful old man to look at, in a filthy flannel waistcoat and smelling terribly of rum. His bedstead, covered with a tumbled and ragged piece of patchwork, was in the den he had come from, where another little window showed a prospect of more stinging nettles and a lame donkey. "'Oh, what do you want?' grinned this old man in a fierce, monotonous whine. "'Oh, my eyes and limbs, what do you want? Oh, my lungs and liver, what do you want? Oh, guru, guru! I was so much dismayed by these words, and particularly by the repetition of the last unknown one, which was a kind of rattle in his throat, that I could make no answer. Hereupon the old man, still holding me by the hair, repeated, "'Oh, what do you want? Oh, my eyes and limbs, what do you want? Oh, my lungs and liver, what do you want? Oh, guru!' which he screwed out of himself with an energy that made his eyes start in his head. "'I wanted to know,' I said, trembling, "'if you would buy a jacket.' "'Oh, let me see the jacket,' cried the man. "'Oh, my heart on fire, show the jacket to us. "'Oh, my eyes and limbs, bring the jacket out.' "'With that he took his trembling hands, "'which were like the claws of a great bird, out of my hair, "'and put on a pair of spectacles not at all ornamental "'to his inflamed eyes. "'Oh, how much for the jacket?' cried the old man, after examining it. "'Oh, guru, how much for the jacket?' "'Half a crown,' I answered, recovering myself. "'Oh, my lungs and liver,' cried the old man. "'Oh, my eyes, no. Oh, my limbs, no. Eighteen pence, guru.' Every time he uttered this ejaculation, his eyes seemed to be in danger of starting out, and every sentence he spoke he delivered in a sort of tune, always exactly the same, and more like a gust of wind which begins low, mounts up high, and falls again, than any other comparison I can find for it. "'Well,' I said, glad to have closed the bargain, "'I'll take eighteen pence.' "'Oh, my liver!' cried the old man, throwing the jacket on a shelf. "'Get out of the shop! Oh, my lungs, get out of the shop! Oh, my eyes and limbs, guru! Don't ask for money. Make it an exchange. I never was so frightened in my life before or since, but I told him humbly that I wanted money, and that nothing else was of any use to me, but that I would wait for it as he desired outside, and had no wish to hurry him. So I went outside and sat down in the shade in a corner, and I sat there so many hours that the shade became sunlight, and the sunlight became shade again, and still I sat there waiting for the money. There never was such another drunken madman in that line of business, I hope. That he was well known in the neighbourhood and enjoyed the reputation of having sold himself to the devil, I soon understood from the visits he received from the boys, who continually came skirmishing about the shop, shouting that legend, and calling him to bring out his gold. "'You ain't poor, you know, Charlie, as you pretend. Bring out your gold. Bring out some of the gold you sold yourself to the devil for. Come!' It's in the lining of the mattress, Charlie. Rip it open and let's have some. This and many offers to lend him a knife for the purpose exasperated him to such a degree that the whole day was a succession of rushes on his part and flights on the part of the boys. Sometimes in his rage he would take me from one of them and come at me, mouthing as if he were going to tear me in pieces, then, remembering me just in time, would dive into the shop and lie upon his bed, as I thought from the sound of his voice, yelling in a frantic way to his own windy tune, the death of Nelson, 
with an O oh before every line, and innumerable gurus interspersed. As if this were not bad enough for me, the boys, connecting me with the establishment on account of the patience and perseverance with which I sat outside, half-dressed, pelted me and used me very ill all day. He made many attempts to induce me to consent to an exchange, at one time coming out with a fishing-rod, at another with a fiddle, at another with a cocked hat, at another with a flute. But I resisted all these overtures, and sat there in desperation, each time asking him with tears in my eyes for my money or my jacket. At last he began to pay me in half-pence at a time, and was full two hours getting by easy stages to a shilling. "'Oh, my eyes and limbs!' he then cried, peeping hideously out of the shop after a long pause. "'Will you go for twopence more?' "'I can't,' I said. "'I shall be starved.' Oh, my lungs and liver, will you go for threepence? I would go for nothing if I could, I said, but I want the money badly. Oh, Guru! It is really impossible to express how he twisted this ejaculation out of himself as he peeped round the doorpost at me, showing nothing but his crafty old head. Will you go for fourpence? I was so faint and weary that I closed with this offer, and taking the money out of his claw, not without trembling, went away more hungry and thirsty than I had ever been, a little before sunset. But at an expense of threepence I soon refreshed myself completely, and being in better spirits then, limped seven miles upon my road. My bed at night was under another haystack, where I rested comfortably. After having washed my blistered feet in a stream, and dressed them as well as I was able with some cool leaves. When I took the road again next morning, I found that it lay through a succession of hop-grounds and orchards. It was sufficiently late in the year for the orchards to be ruddy with ripe apples, and in a few places the hop-pickers were already at work. I thought it all extremely beautiful, and made up my mind to sleep among the hops that night, imagining some cheerful companionship in the long perspectives of poles, with the graceful leaves twining round them. The trampers were worse than ever that day, and inspired me with a dread that is yet quite fresh in my mind. Some of them were most ferocious-looking ruffians who stared at me as I went by, and stopped, perhaps, and called after me to come back and speak to them, and when I took to my heels, stoned me. I recollect one young fellow, a tinker, I suppose, from his wallet and brazier, who had a woman with him, and who faced about and stared at me thus, and then roared to me in such a tremendous voice to come back, that I halted and looked round. "'Come here when you're called,' said the tinker or I'll rip your young body open. I thought it best to go back. As I drew near to them, trying to propitiate the tinker by my looks, I observed that the woman had a black eye. "'Where are you going?' said the tinker, gripping the bosom of my shirt with his blackened hand. "'I'm going to Dover,' I said. "'Where do you come from?' asked the tinker, giving his hand another turn in my shirt to hold me more securely. "'I come from London,' I said. "'What lay are you upon?' said the tinker. "'Are you a prig?' "'No,' I said. "'Ain't you, by God? "'If you make a brag out of your honesty to me,' said the tinker, "'I'll knock your brains out.' With his disengaged hand he made a menace of striking me, and then looked at me from head to foot. "'Have you got the price of a pint of beer about you?' said the tinker. "'If you have, out with it, afore I take it away.' I should certainly have produced it but that I met the woman's look, and saw her very slightly shake her head and form, no, with her lips. I am very poor, I said, attempting to smile, and I've got no money. Why, what do you mean? said the tinker, looking so sternly at me that I almost feared that he saw the money in my pocket. Sir, I stammered. What do you mean, said the tinker, by wearing my brother's silk handkerchief? Give it over here. And he had mine off my neck in a moment, and tossed it to the woman. The woman burst into a fit of laughter, as if she thought this a joke, and tossed it back to me, nodded once as slightly as before, and made the word go with her lips. 
Before I could obey, however, the tinker seized the handkerchief out of my hand with a roughness that threw me away like a feather, and putting it loosely round his own neck, turned upon the woman with an oath and knocked her down. I never shall forget seeing her fall backwards on the hard road, and lie there with her bonnet tumbled off and her hair all whitened in the dust, nor when I looked back from a distance seeing her sitting on the pathway, which was a bank by the roadside, wiping the blood from her face with the corner of her shawl while he went on ahead. This adventure frightened me so that afterwards, when I saw any of these people coming, I turned back until I could find a hiding place where I remained until they had gone out of sight, which happened so often that I was very seriously delayed. But under this difficulty, as under all the other difficulties of my journey, I seemed to be sustained and led on by my fanciful picture of my mother in her youth, before I came into the world. It always kept me company. It was there among the hops when I lay down to sleep. It was with me on my waking in the morning. It went before me all day. I have associated it ever since with the sunny street of Canterbury, dozing as it were in the hot light, and with the sight of its old houses and gateways and the stately grey cathedral with the rooks sailing round the towers. When I came at last upon the bare wide downs near Dover, it relieved the solitary aspect of the scene with hope, and not until I reached that first great aim of my journey and actually set foot in the town itself on the sixth day of my flight did it desert me. But then, strange to say, when I stood with my ragged shoes and my dusty, sunburnt, half-clothed figure in a place so long desired, it seemed to vanish like a dream and to leave me helpless and dispirited. I inquired about my aunt among the boatmen first, and received various answers. One said she lived in the South Foreland Light, and had singed her whiskers by doing so. Another that she was made fast to the great boy outside the harbour, and could only be visited at half-tide. A third that she was locked up in Maidstone jail for child-stealing. A fourth that she was seen to mount her broom in the last high wind, and make direct for Calais. The fly-drivers among whom I inquired next were equally jocose and equally disrespectful, and the shopkeepers, not liking my appearance, generally replied without hearing what I had to say that they had nothing for me. I felt more miserable and destitute than I had done at any period of my running away. My money was all gone, I had nothing left to dispose of, I was hungry, thirsty and worn out, and seemed as distant from my end as if I had remained in London. The morning had worn away in these inquiries, and I was sitting on the step of an empty shop at a street corner near the market-place, deliberating upon wandering towards the other places which had been mentioned, when a fly-carrier, coming by with his carriage, dropped a horse-cloth. Something good-natured in the man's face, as I handed it up, encouraged me to ask him if he could tell me where Miss Trotwood lived, though I had asked the question so often that it almost died upon my lips. Trotwood, said he, let me see. I know the name, too. Old lady. Yes, I said, rather. Pretty stiff in the back, said he, making himself upright. Yes, I said, I should think it very likely. Carries a bag, said he, bag with a good deal of room in it. Is gruffish, and comes down upon you sharp. My heart sank within me as I acknowledged the undoubted accuracy of his description. Why, then, I'll tell you what said he, if you go up there, pointing with his whip towards the heights, and keep right on till you come to some houses facing the sea, I think you'll hear of her. My opinion is she won't stand anything, so here's a penny for you. I accepted the gift thankfully, and bought a loaf with it. Dispatching this refreshment by the way, I went in the direction my friend had indicated, and walked on a good distance without coming to the houses he had mentioned. At length I saw some before me, and approaching them, went into a little shop. It was what we used to call a general shop at home, and inquired if they could have the goodness to tell me where Miss Trotwood lived. I addressed myself to the man behind the counter, who was weighing some rice for a young woman, but the latter, taking the inquiry to herself, turned round quickly. "'My mistress,' she said, "'what do you want with her, boy?' "'I want,' I replied, "'to speak to her, if you please.' "'To beg of her, you mean,' retorted the damsel. 
no i said indeed but suddenly remembering that in truth i came for no other purpose i held my peace in confusion and felt my face burn my aunt's housemaid as i supposed she was from what she had said put her rice in a little basket and walked out of the shop telling me that i could follow her if i wanted to know where miss trotwood lived i needed no second permission though i was by this time in such a state of consternation and agitation that my legs shook under me i followed the young woman and we soon came to a very neat little cottage with cheerful bow windows in front of it a small square gravelled court or garden full of flowers carefully tended and smelling delicious this is miss trotwood's said the young woman now you know and that's all i have got to say with which words she hurried into the house, as if to shake off the responsibility of my appearance, and left me standing at the garden gate looking disconsolately over the top of it towards the parlour window, where a muslin curtain partly undrawn in the middle, and a large round green screen or fan fastened on to the window-sill, a small table, and a great chair, suggested to me that my aunt might be at that moment seated in awful state. My shoes were by this time in a woeful condition, the soles had shed themselves bit by bit, and the upper leathers had broken and burst until the very shape and form of shoes had departed from them. My hat, which had served me for a nightcap too, was so crushed and bent that no old battered handleless saucepan on a dunghill need have been ashamed to vie with it. My shirt and trousers, stained with heat, dew, grass, and the Kentish soil on which I had slept, and torn besides, might have frightened the birds from my aunt's garden as I stood at the gate. My hair had known no comb or brush since I left London, my face, neck, and hands, from unaccustomed exposure to the air and sun, were burnt to a berry brown. From head to foot I was powdered almost as white with chalk dust, as if I had come out of a lime kiln. In this plight, and with a strong consciousness of it, I waited to introduce myself to, and make my first impression on, my formidable aunt. The unbroken stillness of the parlour window, leading me to infer after a while that she was not there, I lifted my eyes up to the window above it where I saw a florid, pleasant-looking gentleman, with a grey head, who shut up one eye in a grotesque manner, and nodded his head at me several times, shook it at me as often, laughed, and went away. I had been discomposed enough before, but I was so much more discomposed by this unexpected behaviour, that I was on the point of slinking off, to think how I had best proceed when there came out of the house a lady with her handkerchief tied over her cap, and a pair of gardening gloves on her hands, wearing a gardening pocket like a tall man's apron, and carrying a great knife. I knew her immediately to be Miss Betsy, for she came stalking out of the house exactly as my poor mother had so often described her stalking up our garden at Blunderstone Rookery. "'Go away!' said Miss Betsy, shaking her head, and making a distant chop at the air with her knife. "'Go along! No boys here!' I watched her, with my heart at my lips, as she marched to a corner of her garden, and stooped to dig up some little root there. Then, without a scrap of courage, but with a great deal of desperation, I went softly in and stood beside her, touching her with my finger. "'If you please, ma'am,' I began. She started and looked up. "'If you please, aunt—' "'Eh?' exclaimed Miss Betsy, in a tone of amazement I have never heard approached. "'If you please, aunt, I am your nephew.' "'Oh, Lord!' said my aunt, and sat flat down in the garden path. "'I am David Copperfield, of Blunderstone, in Suffolk, where you came on the night when I was born, and saw my dear mamma. I have been very unhappy since she died. I have been slighted, and taught nothing, and, and thrown upon myself, and put to work not fit for me. It made me run away to you. I was robbed at first setting out, and have walked all the way, and have never slept in a bed since I began the journey. Here my self-support gave way all at once, and with the movement of my hands intended to show her my ragged state, and call it to witness that I had suffered something. I broke into a passion of crying, which I suppose had been pent up within me all the week. 
My aunt, with every sort of expression but wonder discharged from her countenance, sat on the gravel staring at me until I began to cry. When she got up in a great hurry, collared me and took me into the parlour. Her first proceeding there was to unlock a tall press, bring out several bottles, and pour some of the contents of each into my mouth. I think they must have been taken out at random, for I am sure I tasted aniseed water, anchovy sauce, and salad dressing. When she had administered these restoratives, as I was still quite hysterical and unable to control my sobs, she put me on the sofa, with a shawl under my head, and a handkerchief from her own head under my feet, lest I should sully the cover, and then, sitting herself down behind the green fan or screen I have already mentioned, so that I could not see her face, ejaculated at intervals, "'Mercy on us!' letting those exclamations off like minute guns. After a time she rang the bell. "'Janet!' said my aunt when her servant came in. "'Go upstairs and give my compliments to Mr. Dick, and say I wish to speak to him.' Janet looked a little surprised to see me lying stiffly on the sofa. I was afraid to move, lest it should be displeasing to my aunt, but went on with her errand. My aunt, with her hands behind her, walked up and down the room, until the gentleman who had squinted at me from the upper window came in laughing. "'Mr. Dick,' said my aunt, don't be a fool, because nobody can be more discreet than you can when you choose. We all know that, so don't be a fool, whatever you are. This gentleman was serious immediately, and looked at me, I thought, as if he would entreat me to say nothing about the window. Mr. Dick, said my aunt, you have heard me mention David Copperfield. Now don't pretend you have no memory, because you and I know better. David Copperfield? said Mr. Dick, who did not appear to me to remember much about it. David Copperfield. Oh, yes, to be sure. David, certainly. Well, said my aunt, this is his boy, his son. He would be as like his father as it is possible to be, if he were not so like his mother, too. His son, said Mr. Dick. David's son, indeed. Yes, pursued my aunt. "'and he has done a pretty piece of business. "'He has run away. "'His sister Betsy Trotwood would never have run away.' "'My aunt shook her head firmly, "'confident in the character and behaviour of the girl who was never born. "'Oh, you think she wouldn't have run away?' said Mr. Dick. "'A oh, blessing save the man!' exclaimed my aunt sharply. "'How he talks! Don't I know she wouldn't? "'She would have lived with her godmother, "'and we would have been devoted to one another.' Where, in the name of wonder, should his sister, Betsy Trotwood, have run from, or to? Nowhere, said Mr. Dick. Well, then, returned my aunt, softened by the reply, how can you pretend to be wool-gathering, Dick, when you are as sharp as a surgeon's lancet? Now, here you see young David Copperfield, and the question I put to you is, what shall we do with him? What shall you do with him? said Mr. Dick feebly, scratching his head. Oh, do with him. Yes, said my aunt with a grave look, and her forefinger held up. Come, I want some very sound advice. Oh, I, if I was you, said Mr. Dick, considering and looking vacantly at me, I should, the contemplation of me seemed to inspire him with a sudden idea, and he added briskly, I should wash him. "'Janet!' said my aunt, turning round with a quiet triumph, which I did not then understand. "'Mr. Dick sees us all right. Heat the bath.' Though I was deeply interested in this dialogue, I could not help observing my aunt, Mr. Dick, and Janet, while it was in progress, and contemplating a survey I had already been engaged in making of the room. My aunt was a tall, hard-featured lady, but by no means ill-looking. There was an inflexibility in her face, in her voice, in her gait and carriage, amply sufficient to account for the effect she made upon a gentle creature like my mother, but her features were rather handsome than otherwise, though unbending and austere. I particularly noticed that she had a very quick, bright eye. Her hair, which was grey, was arranged in two plain divisions under what I believe to be called a mob-cap. I mean a cap much more common then than now, with side-pieces fastening under the chin. 
Her dress was of a lavender colour and perfectly neat, but scantily made, as if she desired to be as little encumbered as possible. I remember that I thought it in form more like a riding habit with the superfluous skirt cut off than anything else. She wore at her side a gentleman's gold watch, if I might judge from its size and make, with an appropriate chain and seals. She had some linen at her throat, not unlike a shirt collar, and things at her wrists like little shirt wristbands. Mr. Dick, as I have already said, was grey-headed and florid. I should have said all about him in saying so, had not his head been curiously bowed, not by age. It reminded me of one of Mr. Creakle's boy's heads after a beating, and his grey eyes, prominent and large, with a strange kind of watery brightness in them, that made me, in combination with his vacant manner, his submission to my aunt, and his childish delight when she praised him, suspect him of being a little mad, though if he were mad, how he came to be there puzzled me extremely. He was dressed like any other ordinary gentleman, in a loose grey morning coat, and waistcoat and white trousers, and had his watch in his fob and his money in his pockets, which he rattled as if he were very proud of it. Janet was a pretty blooming girl of about nineteen or twenty, and a perfect picture of neatness. Though I made no further observation of her at that moment, I may mention here what I did not discover until afterwards, namely, that she was one of a series of protégés whom my aunt had taken into her service expressly to educate in a renouncement of mankind, and who had generally completed their abjuration by marrying the baker. The room was as neat as Janet or my aunt. As I laid down my pen a moment since to think of it, the air from the sea came blowing in again, mixing with the perfume of the flowers, and I saw the old-fashioned furniture brightly rubbed and polished, my aunt's inviolable chair and table by the round green fan in the bow window, the drugget-covered carpet, the cat, the kettle-holder, the two canaries, the old china, the punch-bowl full of dried rose-leaves, the tall press guarding all sorts of bottles and pots, and, wonderfully out of keeping with the rest, my dusty self upon the sofa, taking note of everything. Janet had gone away to get the bath ready when my aunt, to my great alarm, became in one moment rigid with indignation, and had hardly voice to cry out, "'Janet! Donkeys!' Upon which Janet came running up the stairs as if the house were in flames, darted out on to a little piece of green in front, and warned off two saddle donkeys, lady-ridden, that had presumed to set hoof upon it, while my aunt, rushing out of the house, seized the bridle of a third animal laden with a bestriding child, turned him, led him forth from those sacred precincts, and boxed the ears of the unlucky urchin in attendance who had dared to profane that hallowed ground. To this hour I don't know whether my aunt had any lawful right of way over that patch of green, but she had settled it in her own mind that she had, and it was all the same to her. The one great outrage of our life, demanding to be constantly avenged, was the passage of a donkey over that immaculate spot. In whatever occupation she was engaged, however interesting to her conversation in which she was taking part, a donkey turned the current of her ideas in a moment, and she was upon him straight. Jugs of water and watering pots were kept in secret places ready to be discharged on the offending boys. Sticks were laid in ambush behind the door. Sallies were made at all hours, and incessant war prevailed. Perhaps this was an agreeable excitement to the donkey boys, or perhaps the more sagacious of the donkeys, understanding how the case stood, delighted with constitutional obstinacy in coming that way. I only know that there were three alarms before the bath was ready, and that on the occasion of the last and most desperate of all, I saw my aunt engage single-handed with a sandy-headed lad of fifteen, and bump his sandy head against her own gate, before he seemed to comprehend what was the matter. These interruptions were of the more ridiculous to me, because she was giving me broth out of a tablespoon at the time, having firmly persuaded herself that I was actually starving and must receive nourishment at first in very small quantities, and, while my mouth was yet open to receive the spoon, she would put it back into the basin, cry, "'Janet! Donkeys!' and go out to the assault. 
The bath was a great comfort, for I began to be sensible of acute pains in my limbs from lying about in the fields, and was now so tired and so low that I could hardly keep myself awake for five minutes together. When I had bathed, they, I mean my aunt and Janet, enrobed me in a shirt and a pair of trousers belonging to Mr. Dick, and tied me up in two or three great shawls. What sort of bundle I looked like I don't know, but I felt a very hot one. Feeling so very faint and drowsy, I soon lay down on the sofa again, and fell asleep. It might have been a dream, originating in the fancy which had occupied my mind so long, but I awoke with the impression that my aunt had come and bent over me, and had put my hair away from my face and laid my head more comfortably, and then stood looking at me. The words, "'Pretty fellow,' or "'Poor fellow,' seemed to be in my ears too, but certainly there was nothing else, when I awoke, to lead me to believe that they had been uttered by my aunt, who sat by the bow window gazing at the sea from behind the green fan, which was mounted on a kind of swivel and turned any way. We dined soon after I awoke, off a roast fowl and pudding. I, sitting at the table, not unlike a trussed bird myself, and moving my arms with considerable difficulty, but as my aunt had swathed me up, I made no complaint of being inconvenienced. All this time I was deeply anxious to know what she was going to do with me, but she took her dinner in profound silence, except when she occasionally fixed her eyes on me sitting opposite and said, "'Mercy upon us!' which did not by any means relieve my anxiety. The cloth being drawn and some sherry put on the table, of which I had a glass, my aunt sent up for Mr. Dick again, who joined us, and looked as wise as he could when she requested him to attend my story, which he elicited from me gradually by a course of questions. During my recital she kept her eyes on Mr. Dick, who I thought would have gone to sleep but for that, and who, whensoever he lapsed into a smile, was checked by a frown for my aunt. "'Whatever possessed that poor unfortunate baby that she must go and be married again?' said my aunt when I had finished, I can't conceive. Perhaps she fell in love with her second husband, Mr. Dick suggested. Fell in love, repeated my aunt. What do you mean? What business had she to do it? Uh, perhaps, Mr. Dick simpered after thinking a little, she did it for pleasure. Pleasure indeed! replied my aunt, a mighty pleasure for the poor baby to fix her simple faith upon a dog of a fellow, certain to ill-use her in some way or other. What did she propose to herself, I should like to know? She had had one husband. She had seen David Copperfield out of the world, who was always running after waxed dolls from his cradle. She had got a baby. Oh, there were a pair of babies when she gave birth to this child sitting here that Friday night. And what more did she want?' Mr. Dick secretly shook his head at me, as if he thought there was no getting over this. "'She couldn't even have a baby like anyone else,' said my aunt. "'Where was this child's sister, Betsy Trotwood? Not forthcoming. Don't tell me.' Mr. Dick seemed quite frightened. "'That little man of a doctor with his head on one side,' said my aunt. "'Jellops, or whatever his name was. What was he about?' All he could do was say to me, like a robin redbreast, as he is, It's a boy. A boy, yeah, the imbecility of the whole set of them. The heartiness of the ejaculation startled Mr. Dick exceedingly, and me too, if I am to tell the truth. And then, as if this was not enough, and she had not stood sufficiently in the light of this child's sister, Betsy Trotwood, said my aunt, she marries a second time goes and marries a murderer, not a man with a name like it, and stands in this child's light. And the natural consequence is, as anybody but a baby might have foreseen, that he prowls and wanders. He's as like Cain before he was grown up as he can be. Mr. Dick looked hard at me, as if to identify me in this character. And then there's that woman with a pagan name, said my aunt, that Peggotty. She goes and gets married next. Because she has not seen enough of the evil attending such things, she goes and gets married next, as the child relates. I only hope, said my aunt, shaking her head, that her husband is one of those poker husbands who abound in the newspapers and will beat her well with one. I could not 
bear to hear my old nurse so decried, and made the subject of such a wish. I told my aunt that indeed she was mistaken, that Peggotty was the best, the truest, the most faithful, most devoted, and most self-denying friend and servant in the world, who had ever loved me dearly, who had ever loved my mother dearly, and who held my mother's dying head upon her arm, on whose face my mother had imprinted her last grateful kiss, and my remembrance of them both choking me, I broke down as I was trying to say that her home was my home, and that all she had was mine, and that I would have gone to her for shelter her but for her humble station which made me fear that i might bring some trouble on her i broke down as i say as i was trying to say so and laid my face in my hands upon the table well well said my aunt the child is right to stand by those who have stood by him janet donkeys i thoroughly believe that but for those unfortunate donkeys we should have come to a good understanding for my aunt had laid her hand on my shoulder, and the impulse was upon me, thus emboldened, to embrace her and beseech her protection. But the interruption and the disorder she was thrown into by the struggle outside put an end to all softer ideas for the present, and kept my aunt indignantly declaiming to Mr. Dick about her determination to appeal for redress to the laws of her country and to bring actions for trespass against the whole donkey proprietorship of Dover until tea-time. After tea we sat at the window, on the lookout, as I imagined from my aunt's sharp expression of face, for more invaders, until dusk, when Janet set candles and a backgammon board on the table and pulled down the blinds. "'Now, Mr. Dick,' said my aunt, with her grave look, and her forefinger up as before, "'I am going to ask you another question. Look at this child.' Uh, "'David's son,' said Mr. Dick, with an attentive, puzzled face. "'Exactly so,' returned my aunt. "'What would you do with him now?' "'Do with David's son,' said Mr. Dick. "'Aye,' replied my aunt, "'with David's son.' "'Oh,' said Mr. Dick, "'yes, do with. "'I... I should put him to bed.' "'Janet!' cried my aunt, "'with the same complacent triumph that I had remarked before.' Mr. Dick sets us right. If the bed is ready, we'll take him up to it. Janet reporting it to be quite ready, I was taken up, kindly, but in some sort like a prisoner, my aunt going in front and Janet bringing up the rear. The only circumstance which gave me any new hope was my aunt stopping on the stairs to inquire about a smell of fire that was prevalent there, and Janet replying that she had been making tinder down in the kitchen of my old shirt. But there were no other clothes in my room than the odd heap of things I wore, and when I was left there with a the little taper which my aunt forewarned me would burn exactly five minutes, I heard them lock my door on the outside. Turning these things over in my mind, I deemed it possible that my aunt, who could know nothing of me, might suspect I had a habit of running away, and took precautions on that account to keep me in safe keeping. The room was a pleasant one at the top of the house, overlooking the sea on which the moon was shining brilliantly. After I had said my prayers and the candle had burnt out, I remember how I still sat looking at the moonlight on the water as if I could hope to read my fortune in it, as in a bright book, or to see my mother with her child coming from heaven along that shining path to look upon me as she looked when I last saw her sweet face. I remember how the solemn feeling with which I at length turned my eyes away yielded to the sensation of gratitude and rest which the sight of the white-curtained bed, and how much more the lying softly down upon it, nestling in the snow-white sheets, inspired. I remember how I thought of all the solitary places under the night sky where I had slept, and how I had prayed that I never might be houseless any more, and never might forget the houseless. I remember how I seemed to float off then, down the melancholy glory of that track upon the sea, away into the world of dreams. End of chapter 13